Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to today's show, I want to let you know that we're offering our podcast listeners a special 20% lifetime discount to the China Africa Daily Brief. Now that's the newsletter that Cobus and I produce every day that provides the most comprehensive digest of everything China's doing on the continent and now increasingly throughout the global south. In addition to the newsletter, you'll also get full archive access to the website and the China Africa Experts Network as well. To get that discount, just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe and use the promo code podcast at checkout. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, I gave a talk last week to a group of folks in the United States, and in the Q&A part, invariably, and this happens almost like clockwork, when it's an open discussion on all things related to China, Africa, a question came up about the Chinese importing labor to Africa. Now, you and I have been doing this show for 11 years. You've been studying this topic even longer than that. And I'll say that over the 11 years that we've been doing this together, that issue of the Chinese importing labor is no doubt one of the most durable perceptions of the Chinese in Africa, and should we probably say misperception, simply because it isn't backed up by data. When we actually look at the data on this topic, it really just contradicts that. And when you ask people, you say, where have you heard or seen that information to come to the conclusion that the Chinese are importing vast amounts of labor into Africa? The invariably the answer is, well, I saw it with my own eyes, or I heard it from a friend, or something like anecdotal like that. But yet never do they actually quote a study or research or data. So let me quote the best study here on this topic. And this comes from Professor Carlos Oya at the University of London, who back in 2019 did a really landmark study where they compared 76 companies, 31 of them Chinese in Angola and Ethiopia, and they interviewed 1,500 workers In Ethiopia, they said that the local employment rates were 90% and 100% for low-skilled workers. In Angola, they found that the rate was a bit lower at about 74%, in part due to skill shortages. It's just harder to find people to work there, so they did have to bring in more Chinese for that. When local Africans work for Chinese companies, the stereotype suggests that their employment is precarious, There's lots of long hours, there's a lot of abuse, and there's a lot of these perceptions that go around the labor management relationship between the Chinese and Africa. But Kobus, and I'm sure you probably find this as well in your own talks that you give to people, it's really just quite remarkable that that this myth has kind of stayed. Why do you think that this question about the Chinese importing labor into Africa has been so durable over the years? I think one reason is that that one of the main reasons why Africans are are interested in dealing with China at all is through uh, because of the promise that it's gonna that China is gonna create jobs. So it becomes this it becomes this kind of field where where the the legitimacy of the entire China Africa relationship is kind of decided. And with that, then it's it's also I think the one the one space where where people who just kind of pass by a a Chinese um, construction site, for example, simply through glimpsing different people walking around could then kind of create an, an opinion, you know, kind of more than they would be able to about trade or investment, for example. So I think it's one of those things where people both feel that that they that, that it's the most important issue for Africa in, in relation to China, and then also the one where people feel most empowered to kind of make a snap decision simply based on rumors or what, what, they, what they thought they saw when they went past a, a particular construction site. 
It's interesting because a lot of politicians in the mid-2000s also made quite a bit of hay out of this issue, in part because in those early days that the Chinese were in Africa in 2003, 4, and 5, they did bring in larger quantities of workers simply because they were new on the ground, they didn't have the relationships to source labor, and people like former Zambian President Michael Sada made his campaign for president on the back of saying, we're going to kick the Chinese out. Remember he had that comment about there's no Chinese are going to push wheelbarrows, and that was this real popular sentiment, and I think that really stuck, and then we've seen that meme used quite a bit across the continent over the years since Michael Sada did that. The logic of bringing in Chinese labor to Africa today doesn't even make sense on its surface when you just dive into the demographics of the Chinese. Chinese workers today are much more expensive than they were 15, 20 years ago because, of course, we know that there is a demographic inverse in China than there is in Africa. Unlike Africa, which is a pyramid, which is a large bottom of young people and a small top of old people, China is the opposite. Its demographics are inverted. It's a very small percentage of young people, lots of old people at the top. And so bringing in workers from China to Africa is a very expensive proposition when you take into account their travel, the fees that you have to pay, the security, all of the other things that go with it. So the economics of it don't really make sense. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the relationship on the work site itself. And what's it like to work for Chinese companies? Because just as there's a lot of misperceptions about the presence of Chinese labor in Africa, there are also misperceptions about what it's like to work for Chinese companies on the continent. And there was this great article that came over on the Monkey Cage column, which is a Washington Post feature. And they've been doing a whole series this year on China-Africa relations in partnership with the China Africa Research Initiative at Johns Hopkins University. One of those articles that was published earlier this month in April is by Ding Fei, who's a postdoctoral research associate at Arizona State University in the United States. She studies Chinese overseas investment and capital labor relations in Africa. And her monkey cage column was Chinese companies have different ways of managing African employees. A very good morning to you, Ding. Good morning, Eric and Kobas. Nice to meet you both. It's wonderful to have you on the program. I've been looking forward to this discussion for a long time, in part because you're going to help us do some myth busting today. Let me just kind of set up the research that you did, and we'd like to get your assessment of it. Between 2014 and 2017, you researched three Chinese companies in Ethiopia that you say transcend a variety of management practices at Chinese firms in Africa. So the three firms that you looked at, one was Zhonghua Construction, which is a state-owned enterprise. The other one was Huaxia uh, telecom, which is a state-owned, but you say it runs like a private enterprise. And then there's Uchi Autos, which is a private auto assembly company that's there. Tell us a little bit about the basis of your research and why you chose those three companies and why you focused on Ethiopia. Just give us a broad introduction to the research that you did. Actually, when I just started uh, considering doing China-Africa relations, um, Ethiopia came up as a, a important uh, country that I'm interested in studying because of first because of its strategic importance to China. It's a geographic location in the Horn of Africa. It's the headquarter of AU kind of a gate uh, Africa Union kind of a gateway uh, of China's diplomacy to Africa, and importantly, it's not a resource rich country. And um, when we talk about China Chinese investment in Africa, oh, people will tend to say that it's resource uh, extraction and uh, heavily concentrated on the resource rich countries but Ethiopia given that given given it's not a quite a resource rich and they're at the same time in a very large amounts of Chinese investment I think studying Ethiopia can give us a, a unique perspective into what Chinese are doing, what are the um, like underground relations developed in the country. So that's part of the reason that I study um, China-Ethiopia relation. And another uh, factor is that um, Ethiopia followed kind of a state-led development for decades and it kind of a similar um, development ideology as China. So I want to see how this kind of political affiliation um, can translate to, to the business activities and labor relations. And uh, when I 
look into the literature, the sort of to to plan for my research, I saw a lot of studies focusing on construction uh, or other labor intensive sectors. So at that at that time, I'm interested to know does Chinese companies of different type of ownership engaging in different sectors have the same ways of operation. So that's why I picked the three. Uh, actually, I studied more than these three, but uh, these three are kind of an in-depth analysis. Um, so they focused on construction, telecommunications, and manufacturing or kind of auto assembling sectors. And I choose them also because, of course, I have to have the research access, uh, but also because they entered Ethiopia uh, relatively early. Um, so they have, when I start, when I uh, research these companies, they have spent uh, at least the 10 years in Ethiopia. So I can uh, kind of trace how they develop or how their management strategies change over the years. So kind of give us an uh, understanding of how Chinese companies may adjust their management strategies over time. So to put this in, in context, can you give us an idea of, of what kind of rules Ethiopia has about foreign labor? You know, kind of what, you know, how how much, how, how strict are they about, about local employment and, and, and also on, on issues like skills transfer, for example? Yes. Um, for example, when they signed a construction contract with Chinese companies, there is actually um, like a statement saying a certain percent of the workforce has to be local employees. And uh, they also have, when they have the, the economic zone uh, regulations came out, they have uh, specific items like saying uh, you can use Chinese uh, labor or Chinese managers at certain positions. And, for, and over time, it requires companies to replace Chinese with locals. And it, when I was in the field, I was told by um, people that working on human resource, the Chinese uh, human resource managers saying um, they observe the increasingly tightened uh, uh, like policy by the Ethiopian immigration office to offer foreign work visa to the Chinese or to foreign employees. So uh, the Chinese sometimes will come on business visa and convert it to a local work permit. That process was relatively easier before, but during my research, I was told it's getting much longer, much harder, and sometimes because the business visa is just the one month and sometimes it exceeds that one month duration, uh, so causing extra burdens for the companies. So that's become one of the uh, kind of pushes for companies to recruit more local employees. I'm curious to hear what you think it's like to work for Chinese companies uh, in Africa. And again, many of this of these issues also apply to other countries around the world. But the reputation is terrible. The reputation is that they are overworked, that the managers are very tough, very demanding, that they don't pay very well, and that the expectations are extraordinarily high. And, and oftentimes this is based on the fact that what we see is usually the negatives that pop up in the news. And last year during COVID, there was a steel factory in Nigeria that reportedly had just horrific conditions. We saw a similar situation in Zambia. There, a couple years ago, there was the beating of a Kenyan restaurant employee by a Chinese chef. And, and so that's what stands out in people's minds. And I'm curious to get your response on the research you found, now, albeit you just talked to three companies, so it's not that much. And if we think back to what Irene Yuan Sun, who was the former McKinsey consultant, now at the Center for Global Development, she wrote a book that is now famously quoted all over the place, The Next Factory of the World, How Chinese Investment is Reshaping Africa. And she had a statistic in there that said there are 10,000 factories or 10,000 Chinese companies in Africa today. So a lot of people on the continent are working for Chinese companies. From your research, what is that experience like? Well, I think uh, the main argument of my research is the experience is not cross-board. Uh, cross it's kind of specific to the type of company, the, um, uh, the, the sector, the industrial sector, um, that um, uh, we, we looked at. So just to give you an example of the construction sector, which has been a lot of reports that focus on 
um, in the construction company that I studied, and by the way, um, that's that company has m- many many projects across Africa and other countries. So um, although it's a single case that I studied, I, uh, I I believe it's kind of representative of how the things are are managed uh, in in other places as well. So um, if we look at the construction company, we will see it's not just simply like Chinese managers versus local workers. There are different tiers of um, like the hierarchy on, on, on the Chinese uh, construction site. There's Chinese managers working for the contractor, which is um, they are like kind of the top of the hierarchy. And uh, there are also Chinese workers employed by Chinese subcontractors. Uh, these are mostly private subcontractors uh, working overseas for the Chinese contractor, and they bring their Chinese technicians, uh, four men to to work on the project. And these Chinese uh, workers, uh, in, in in my research, I found that they are uh, subject to um, some of the uh, kind of the harsh working conditions that we uh, see over the years. When you say Chinese workers, are you referring to skilled labor or unskilled labor? Well, they are skilled labor, uh, so they are usually foremen on, on the compound, uh, but they are not like a formal employees. Some of them are, are, are like kind of outsourced the laborers to work on the construction site, and they are not SOE, like state-owned enterprise employees, so they don't have the job security and, uh, and, and benefits and other stuff. So they are kind of the, the Chinese laborers um, on, the, on the compound, but they are also kind of the team lead, uh, leaders of local workers. So they usually manage um, and a group of local workers to work on the construction site. So, um, so, so go back to my argument is these workers are suffer, suffer from like ex, uh, exit control, very um, uh, exit control upon, like they cannot move uh, free, freely out, out in, in, in and out the compound. And uh, they are kind of socially excluded because they spend all the time inside the Chinese compound. And of course they have, uh, they are subject to overtime work, delayed payments, salary cut, and um, in, in some cases, high local spending. So they have to pay for their lunch and meals. They are not like covered by the company. And then we have local managers, and these managers are recruited uh, on formal contract by the contractors. So they have formal contract, they enjoy the benefits, and they kind of develop informal mentorship with the Chinese managers, because these are like a small group. In, in my research, there are like 20 or so local managers working in the contractor compound. So, and they have e- uh, exposure to multiple tasks, and they have respect from the Chinese supervisors. Um, and, uh, you know, for the construction compound, the contract is usually like two to three years, depending on the project timeline. But these local managers have chances to move around with the country for uh, the next project. And then we have the local workers who are employed uh, usually through a local recruiter um, uh, and they, they work for the subcontractors. And for the subcontractors, given they are kind of on the same profit margin, they are more like pro- profit ma- maximizers. So uh, of course, the, you see with the Chinese workers, there's problems of overtime work. But for local workers, what I found is interesting because they are mostly considered manual workers. And uh, so so the, the, the employment relations are relatively flexible and the locals are not, um, managers have very loose control over their attendance and physical mobility. And they are not like suffer fr- from my research, they don't, ex- they are not suffer from the long time work that we see typical for Chinese workers. Uh, but they do work as manual labor so that they don't have much um, of the exposure to, to um, like multiple tasks and to develop their skills. So it's very interesting that there's such a kind of split in conditions just simply between the, the state-owned enterprise and the subcontractors. How, do, how does this situation then compare to the other two companies that you, that you investigated, the telecom company and the, and the private company? Yes, uh, the telecom company, uh, I would say, is a kind of typical 
um, SOE, although it's a kind of a privately operate. Um, I say typical SOE because it's a very strictly hierarchical. Uh, they have different layers of management and uh, um, high level management, mid level management, and they use very specific evaluation and promotion criteria for you to move up the hierarchy. So it takes years, even for the Chinese, to really get promoted. Um, so uh, the employee, uh, the in terms of local employees, the uh, localization rate in this company is around forty five percent, and I was told mainly because the lack of high highly skilled and well educated local telecom uh, personnel. Uh, but they do have different ways of getting uh, of recruiting locals. Um, they they have um, they 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 have the, this kind of a uh, campus uh, recruitment of, uh, to get the fresh graduates uh, uh, to work in their companies. And the company also use uh, outsourced employees for some unessential positions. And for those who did well, um, they were promoted into a uh, a full employee in the company. So this is the second way they got their local employees. And the third way is if they have a current employee that has someone that they want to refer, uh, so the company also take like employee referral. Um, as for the Chinese, the Chinese are mostly existing employees in the domestic branches. So they have an internal talent pool. So uh, when they need someone to work on over, uh, in overseas subsidiary, they will post an ad internally and to, uh, to, to uh, hire someone back home and, uh, and send them to work in Ethiopia. And in terms of um, uh, one thing that I um, that happens in the company is really have a push for localization. That part of it because of the market competition um, going on in telecom sec sector, and the company want to increase its um, its local competitiveness and want to retain its good local talent. So it, uh, there there's a really a push for for localization. Um, uh, uh, so we will see over the years uh, that some mid level or low level managerial positions were given to locals, were transferred to locals, and the company also kind of organized different social events like tree planting or uh, sports games to kind of increase social interaction between Chinese and uh, and and Ethiopians. Um, but there were of course issues within. I will say maybe uh, common for most the Chinese SOEs to prevent uh, putting locals at high-level positions. One is um, um, the, the subsidiary needs to frequ frequently communicate with headquarters and Chinese banks and Chinese government. And during the time, they use the Chinese um, as the language they communicate. And th this kind of language barrier really prevents uh, locals to to uh, join the high leadership group, and there are some other issues. And but the language is not just uh, like uh, the, the, the the spoken language. Uh, in some cases, and that's true for for other companies I'm I'm studying as well. Um, in the companies, the some documents or internal software are also written in in Chinese. So when I talk to some local employees, they will say, "Um, oh, I have to use Google Translator to to make to to know what." what it means. So for locals, there is a deep learning curve to um, get used to the, the language regime and uh, the working style in Chinese companies. You've talked mostly about skilled labor. Did you see any evidence of the unskilled labor, which is where a lot of the political sensitivities come on the ground? When people say that the Chinese are importing labor, they're not talking about mechanical engineers, civil engineers, and electrical engineers. They're talking about the wheelbarrow pushers or drivers. This became an issue last year in the Nigerian House of Representatives where they talked about Chinese drivers at companies. And it became, it was a, there was a fight that broke out online where uh, a lot of Chinese online users said, well, the Chinese bosses prefer to have Chinese drivers so they can talk to them. And you talked about this language barrier. And Nigerians turned around and said, well, is it possible then for a Nigerian company in China to have a Nigerian driver? Of course, the answer is no. It would be outrageous in China to have a Nigerian driver driving around a Nigerian boss because you just couldn't get a visa to do that. And the immigration crackdown would never allow that to happen. So they feel there's a double standard. But I'm curious, in your research, did you find the presence of unskilled Chinese 
labor in these companies? In the con- construction company, there is Chinese workers, but they do have the like kind of the, the, the certificate saying they are like kind of skilled and they are the electrician. Um, although it, it depends on how you define skilled workers, right? From the manager perspective, they will say that these are because they are workers, they are not skilled compared to they don't have a uh, because they don't have a college degree, they don't have the like the fancy fancy titles. But compared to the local um, shortage of certain um, like technicians, they are skilled or I would say like semi-skilled. And what the other thing is why they come to work in Ethiopia, because most of the from my research, I see most of the Chinese workers, they are kind of middle-aged. So when you look at employees in the larger companies, they are kind of 30 in their 30s. But these Chinese workers in the, Chinese, in the compound, they are kind of mid-40s. So they have been working in the, in, the, in, in the construction industry for decades, but they are kind of outcompeted in the domestic market because they are not young. Um, but they still have the skills that accumulated over the years, uh, and they are looking for jobs. So that's part of the their motivation to work in Ethiopia. So it's really hard to compare a say a, a mechanic engineering uh, like college uh, graduate students with um, a a a person who has worked in the in the industry for decades but don't have like say a college degree. So how do you define uh, skilled versus non-skilled workers? I think that's that's the key point. Eric before mentioned um, Irene Irene uh, Yuan Sun and her, and her research on on you know on the similar issue. Um, one of the points that she made in in an interview a while ago was that um, was that it makes it starts making. F- more sense to compare um, companies, uh, foreign companies in Africa, according to sector, rather than according to nationality. So it may, it, you know, she she argued that it makes more sense to look at different construction companies from different countries and compare them to each other, rather than comparing different Chinese companies to each other. I was wondering, in general, whether you agree with her, and also more specifically, whether you saw differences or similarities between the way between these kind of labor practices among Chinese companies and the labor practices among foreign companies in the same sector so other so foreign construction companies foreign telecom companies and so on Yes, uh, it's interesting. When I study, when I look at the manufacturing sector, I did encounter one company, uh, I think it's a European company, and uh, it has a subsidiary in, in South Africa. So that when they decided to open up a factory in Ethiopia, they brought South Africans to work um, in their factories. And when I talked to them, that was back in 2014, they said uh, because of the shortage of, of local skilled labor and because um, they, they need someone to quickly assemble the, 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 the factory line. Uh, so they need to get someone who are very used to uh, what they are doing. So that's why they imported, um, I think, uh, over 100 uh, South Africans to work uh, in the factory. But at the same time, of course, the other Chinese companies, uh, they have some um, Chinese technicians, but because the companies are those private companies in the manufacturing sector, they don't have the economic capacity to bring in large amounts of uh, Chinese um, technicians. And, uh, and of course, that's not, um, that, that's not uh, like saving the cost. So they have large numbers of local Employees, so and they spent time to to train them, um, but the the difference if we compare these two companies is the South Africans they will live in the nearby town in hotels, and they will have like um, so so they they will have the shuttle bus to to kind of transport them to to work in their factories, but all the Chinese live inside the factories on the like, upper level of the factory sheds um, and they like live and eat collectively and uh, uh, of course and they uh, they kind of work long hours so if you look at in, in from the perspective of using uh, labor from the other countries um, there's not just I think part of what you said is is, is right is correct you have to compare um, 
in across in in the same sector and across different、uh, companies. It's not just the picking up Chinese, saying Chinese is is doing this.、Uh, I think it's it's、uh, it's. It's more. It's more helpful to understand the reasons and the logics of their employment strategies, and to look at how it changes over time. In your article and in your paper, you also talk about the the managers themselves who come from China, and you mentioned this earlier in our discussion about some of the language barriers. But there's probably also some very serious cultural differences as well, and managerial approaches in different cultures varies from country to country, and even within a country, there are big differences. I know this for myself as somebody who's managed in many different continents, and a lot of the managers for the state-owned enterprises and for some of the Chinese companies oftentimes have never been overseas before, and so going to Ethiopia or going to Angola or any of these other countries is their first time overseas. Talk to us a little bit about the management styles that they that these that the Chinese companies in each of the three companies you you visited. How do they approach that, and were they able to localize and to better communicate with their staffs?、Mm-hmm. And I think first of all, it's kind of a myth to say Chinese managers have not never worked abroad. I think that might be true,、uh, maybe a decade ago, because in my research,、um, I kind of surveyed the sixty six Chinese uh, working uh, in the different sectors and. Nearly forty of them have worked in other countries,、uh, in Africa, in other can,、uh, in 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 Southeast Asia, in Latin America. And after I completed my research, I still have contact with some of the、uh, Chinese that I met、uh, on the field, and they are most of them are working in different countries right now. So, because their overseas contract is usually two to three years,、uh, some of them will choose to stay in Ethiopia for another project or for another term. Others will go to other countries based on the, the needs of the company. So, in terms of management style, I will say for about part、uh, part of what you said is is correct. They don't have much.、Um, Experiences that they don't have the necessary training to prepare them to work in overseas con- overseas context. So I think what's similar across board is the, the the management is kind of a trial and、uh, error process. So there is a lot of things they have to. Learn, learn from their mistakes, and learn from their success. So, in but in the telecom company, because it's like a more for, formal、um, uh, uh, organization, so they have like a human resource department, and they have human resource managers and staff、uh, looking into like the, the the things of cultural issues and how to promote、um, integration. But I would say this is something、uh, kind of done superficially. Because they have these ideas and they promote these events, but in the end of the day, how the company manage in a way that、uh, locals and、uh, Chinese are using very different、uh, timelines. For example, the the Chinese have their exclusive canteens and they have their shuttle exclusive shuttle bus to transport them from the, their collective residence and to the company. So there's not a lot of casual. Um, op- opportunities for them to to casually interact. So that, despite all these efforts to promote integration,、um, the I think how the ma- the way that the co- the companies manage will prevent greater、uh, integration. And for the construction com-、uh, com- uh, com- com- company, the thing is. The the site is so divided between the con- contractor subcontractor. There are like many issues between、uh, different Chinese companies, and it's not just the one subcontractor. It's for the for the for the company that I studied. It has five different Chinese subcontractors, and they come at different stages and work for different、uh, lengths of time. So. This kind of a division,、um, and how、uh, and that each of them manage their own Chinese and、uh, and local employees. So this kind of division really prevents a, a, a very consistent、um, and and a consistent management、uh, a practice because each company will have its own ways of managing labor and uh, and uh, they stay different times. So th- it's it's not creating a a really a, a coherent a, a good、uh, space. Social space for them to to know each other, and for the、uh, for the, the the small private auto company, I would say、um, more congenial environment、uh, has developed because 
there is a, it's not a large company and it has uh, very few Chinese and the Chinese basically mingled with locals on a daily basis. They share uh, offices and uh, they, they will go lunch together. They don't have kind of a centralized management uh, to, to divide uh, the, the, the two sides. Um, but what's interesting is uh, I did observe a kind of, um, uh, it's not conflict, but a kind of, uh, kind of um, uh, interesting relations between the local managers and local employees. Because uh, th- this, this auto company is the only company that has a, a company union. And when I talk to the union representative about their kind of um, their complaints um, about the company, they mentioned that local managers are not giving them enough, uh, say, um, autonomy or not uh, giving them enough information about what's going on in the, in the company. So it's interesting that because the Chinese are so uh, the number of Chinese are so limited. The locals, the local uh, employees, uh, don't have necessarily have the opportunity to work with Chinese directly, but they work with local managers. So, so you see, there are, there's uh, different dynamics going on in different uh, Chinese companies. That's such an interesting detail, a very telling detail. I thought, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, do you, you know you, you've now watched this this space over several years? Are you getting a sense that African governments are learning from this experience? Are they getting kind of more sophisticated in how they deal with Chinese um, companies around employment issues, and are they also getting more kind of proactive in terms of demanding things like skills transfer? I would say yes, because in my in my uh, research, I kind of documented the different uh, incidences, uh, what we call like African agency, to kind of uh, 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 influence how Chinese manage manage. So we talked about how the uh, Ethiopian Immigration Office changed their policies regarding getting foreign vi- uh, work visa for for the Chinese, and there are also so um, uh, when I looked at the the Eastern Industrial Zone, I was told because uh, there. there there's large amount of local workers needed for for the Chinese companies, and the local government want to retain these jobs for local residents. So the government told uh, Chinese companies to go through its labor offices to recruit workers. So this kind of a, a, another example of how government involved in the recruitment process in Chinese companies. And of course, the different companies I've visited, they will tell me that uh, local labor uh, officers will regularly ins- uh, come and inspect the working conditions conditions and give us recommendations on how, like uh, advice on how, how to improve, make improvement. Um, and uh, uh, the, in terms of the telecom company, uh, it's actually the, the, uh, the local government, the, Af- the Ethiopian government that, uh, uh, that in, in, like kind of invite another Chinese company to work in the telecom sector to increase the competition. Uh, among Chinese companies and to uh, as a way to kind, kind of uh, drive uh, many changes that we talked about in, in these companies. Um, but then, um, of course, uh, I mentioned that uh, the certain items were put in the contract saying you need to promote uh, skills development. But um, one thing that during my interviews that came out, uh, that, that, that came out is, uh, for example, in the construction sector, uh, even though uh there's a there's an item like saying you need to uh, tra- uh like uh, uh teach the local workers how to do certain things but this kind of, and local workers re, uh, and Chinese technicians received additional stipend for doing that um but uh, the thing is the way how the Chinese workers are 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 uh, evaluated run contradict was was the was this kind of incentive to train locals. So uh, the Chinese workers received their salary based on how fast they work, how much work they can they 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 were able to do uh, within a month. So this kind of um, uh, like salary scheme really prevent them to really to seriously invest in training locals because they have to get busy with whatever they are doing. They want to complete as much as I can as they can to to get a high high amount of salary. So this kind of thing really prevents um, a successful or like smooth skills development. So I think. One um, and, and in the Chinese, in the other Chinese companies, uh, you will see that 
training is not just about skills development, like teach people how to do certain things, but more about become an insider or become part of the company. So you have to really understand and appreciate the way that Chinese run uh, run their companies, so that and the develop of good personal relations with uh, the Chinese supervisors or other colleagues. And in that way, you can like the for the local employees. I do see some employees uh, stay happy and uh, very used to the 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 and speak highly of of Chinese ways of 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 doing things. Um, but I would say in order to for this to happen for for all the employees or like uh, have a greater impacts, um, local. African governments needs to do more to not just to put things on paper, but also in um, like kind of a supervise and to to make sure it's actually happening and running and have some schemes to 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 ins uh, to inspect uh, or supervise uh, these companies. One last question before we go, so we can let you get on with your day. Wanted to ask you about the morale of Chinese managers. And there was a fantastic book that came out a couple of years ago by Oxford University scholar Miriam Dreesen. Uh, it's Tales of Hope, Tastes of Bitterness, Chinese Road Builders in Ethiopia. And she profiled a number of Chinese workers there. And one that she showcased was uh, a gentleman by the name of Yu Bohai. And, and here's what she wrote. Initial expectations of life and work there stood in sharp relief to the less rosy realities on the ground, leaving him disenchanted. He could not get his head around why Ethiopians were so unwelcoming, or as he put it, quote-unquote, unfriendly. And it's very difficult for the Chinese managers because they're oftentimes far away from home, they're often isolated from their families, and there is a tension that does exist, as Miriam pointed out, between some of the local workforce and themselves, depending on whether or not they have a grasp of the language, the culture, and all the different things. Talk to us a little bit about the morale of managers that you saw when you did your research? Uh, yes, I think um, it's another thing that are different across companies and probably across uh, uh, across uh, sectors. So the, when we look at the Chinese managers, they are they come up, they work abroad for different vastly different reasons. Um, so for some managerial uh, personnel, they can get like two to three times uh, salary increase for working abroad, and others see uh, working overseas as an opportunity for them to have upward career mobility. So as I mentioned, for many SOEs, it's hard to get promoted, but some managers, when they go out, they were told that uh, they, they can expect a, a half-rank promotion after spending two years overseas. Um, and and uh, of course, there is a high turnover among Chinese. Uh, when I talked to one local employee, and uh, uh, he kind of complained that uh, uh, during his uh, uh, five years in, in the company, he has worked with like over ten Chinese uh, supervisors because people come and go because of they don't uh, they cannot really uh, get used to um, like the overseas work and they are not prepared for the challenges and uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 challenges of uh, uh, abroad um, uh, but I will say uh, there are certain things that uh, that that appears um, in terms of their overseas life one is of course uh, they are kind of living in a, a segregated manner although there are of course variations uh, individual and group variations but uh, most uh, people that I talk to will say the over uh, working abroad is all about work. They don't quite have a life. Um, and there are differences among different groups of Chinese uh, managers uh, and different professionals and, of course, workers. Um, and they, um, I found, um, even though some people will complain about spending time overseas. And I was constantly told that this is my uh, last post. I will go back home. But it's been like many years when I checked on some of the people, they said they were still working in uh, this or that country. So this kind of a hypermobility uh, that I found in my research is because they, most of the, some of the uh, ex uh, Chinese cannot really find a satisfying um, uh, satisfying job position back home. 
So when I talk to some of the managers, they will say uh, you need to have very good connections uh, to find a good job back home. Otherwise, uh, you're kind of stuck in the overseas post. If not, Ethiopia will be Angola or another country. And others kind of uh, face the dilemma of because they relied on the high salary to retain their life status back home, their family's uh, life back home. So they kind of, uh, uh, they cannot find a similar high income job back home. So they kind of uh, uh, got stuck in overseas post and cannot really find a way to return. And others will return for one or two years and find it still not very ideal and they will find another expatriation post um, uh, overseas. So I think, yeah, there are different things going on in their personal lives and how they see their career uh, that will play a role in determining how they, they live abroad. It's absolutely fascinating. Chinese companies have different ways of managing African employees, if that's the article in the Washington Post Monkey Cage column. It's written by Ding Fei, who's a postdoctoral research associate at Arizona State University. Go Sun Devils. Uh, thank you so much, Ding, for joining us and for sharing some of the insights from your article and your research. If people want to follow you on Twitter and, and read what you're reading and writing, tell us where they can find you. Um, I'm on Twitter and uh, I'm Ding Fei 18, I think. Okay, we will put a link to both your article and your Twitter handle in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric. Nice talking to you. Thank you, Kobus. Kobus, it is so important to hear from researchers who have spent time on the ground studying these issues because. Again, I talked about at the beginning of the program, the misperceptions, the myths, the all of the fairy tales that exist about the Chinese, which oftentimes go back decades. And again, she caught me in being caught up in some of that, too. It's really hard to separate yourself from some of these misperceptions. So I'm encouraging everybody listening to the show that when it comes up to these issues like the Chinese labor issue in particular, whether it's on the management side or the unskilled labor side, rather than rely on anecdotes and media and exceptional circumstances. Are there asshole managers from China in Africa who do horrible things to local employees? Of course there are, just like there are from all over the world. That's not exceptional. There are bad bosses from everywhere who do terrible things. The key here is to actually go back to the data. And there's enough research being done by people like Ding, like Carlos Oya, we've interviewed Barry Saltman and Yen Hai Rong on the show as well, and they've done research on Chinese labor practices in Zambia. And there's enough research now that's out there from scholars who've gone up and down the continent to give us a very good understanding of how this works. And what we find over and over again is that the Chinese labor practices oftentimes are not that different from other foreign players. And so the idea that the Chinese live by themselves in compounds that are separated from local employees, well, that's not different than Western managers or Indian or, or Lebanese managers. They don't live together. I mean, here in Vietnam, it's the same situation where I live in a Korean community of Korean managers who run the factories that make all the Nike shoes and all the stuff that people buy in Target and Walmart. They're not living with locals. They're, they have their kids in separate schools. They have their own newspapers, their own restaurants. That's kind of the way that expatriate managers operate all over the world. So I think to your point, Kobus, it's more important to look across industry sector sectors rather than by nationality. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of it, a lot of this kind of discussion has to do also with Africa's kind of peculiar position in the world. Um, one in which these issues are, are so egregious that you know, kind of that that I think there's a kind of a hypersensitivity. I think on not not an unwarranted one on on the African side around these issues, and particularly I think a, lo a lot of a lot of the the kind of you know I agree with you that that frequently the Chinese are kind of treated as a unique case. I think what what kind of underlies that is. You know, and it's difficult to, to articulate it kind of uh, you know, accurately, but I, but I think one of the things that kind of underlies it was that um, – 
the is is the newness of the China Africa relationship historically, you know, kind of so that it it comes in at like the China came in at a moment when Africa was already in a in a post post colonial moment, um, you know, where where they were where where people were actively looking, people had already articulated all of these problems and they were actively looking for for a different solution. So when the Chinese then turn out to be quite similar to other foreigners, that's a that's a disappointment rather than a, a, a you know kind of a, a thing of like well you know we. We need to do. We need to deal with African standards um, in in general. It, it comes down to oh, see, they are exactly the same as the others. You know, there's no future for Africa's relations with the foreign with the foreign world. They're always going to be exploitative. So I think you know, kind of, I think that the kind of the the data is one thing, and then the kind of conclusions drawn by by Africans from that data is, is one thing, and conclusions drawn by Western commentators who have a, a stake in trying to trying to kind of demonize Chinese actors. You know frequently not not always of course um you know is um you, is, is another factor you know so so the, the the narration of the data is is what is, is something kind of a little bit distinct from the data itself i think i'd like to take everybody to ghana right now because over the past couple of weeks there's been a real surge of commentaries in ghanaian media most notably moderngana.com by commentators and by activists who are growing increasingly frustrated with the Galamse. And the Galamse is the illegal Chinese miners or illegal foreign miners, but in this case, the Chinese. And there's this feeling that there's a double standard, that Chinese can come to Ghana and pollute the, the environment. They can get away with being illegal there. They have no regulation of their labor practices and whatnot. And, and, and yet that could never happen in China. And you hear this over and over again. If we did in China what the Chinese do here in Ghana, it wouldn't be tolerated at all. Now, that goes to a question of governance, which you and I have talked about for a long time. Whose fault is that? The Chinese govern their immigration and crack down on it, but Ghana, for some reason, doesn't. Remember, a couple of years ago, there was a brief crackdown of Chinese illegal miners. They rounded them up. They deported a bunch of them. And then that was basically it. But in terms of civil society frustration, there's a lot of it. And I really want to direct people to modern Ghana and what's going on there with the frustrations. And I think that bleeds into all of the rest of the discourse on this issue, because we see these stories, these really well thought out arguments that are really solid. And you think, okay, if this is happening in Ghana on Galamse, and then we see some of the, the terrible behavior in Zambia and Kenya and Nigeria and elsewhere, well, then you start to think, of course, this all kind of stretches across the continent and it's more universal than it really is. How do you approach these issues when you see legitimate claims like what we're seeing in Ghana of illegal behavior and then separating it out from these exceptional circumstances that really do taint how a lot of people understand these issues, these complex issues? Uh, you know, it's, it, this is this is a kind of a drama that we beat a lot. I think on, in in this discussion, um, the the two of us particularly is that uh, is that a, a lot of a lot of what what comes to be coded as kind of anti Chinese op opposition frequently is is really like deeply entangled with frustrations um, among you know among citizens about about kind of levels of governance and enforcement by their own by their own governments. Um, you know, and 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 the fact that that there's always you know there's always this kind of like frisson of, of attention that 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 happens around anything Chinese in Africa, and so that that offers, I think, a, a space for pe for people to then frequently voice, you know, larger larger frustrations with 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 how badly things are enforced, you know. So so one of the things I think that that one really kind of has to be. You have to be. You have to be quite kind of hard nosed. I think in, in in looking at these things, is that there's almost always some kind of local partner involved. There's almost always some some official, some manager, some lo some local actor that kind of that facilitates some of that, either through through corruption or simply by not doing their jobs and not checking up on things. You know. So so in that sense, you know, like I, I can see from I can see from an African perspective where you know kind of how how the the most natural way of of, of articulating this thing is look at these foreigners coming to this to, to this place doing these things in our country that that we wouldn't be able to do there. Which in the first place, if one is Chinese China is a crazy place with a lot of a lot of like kind of like weird you know kind of bad management at the local level with a lot of a lot of kind of like you know, there's a lot of you know it's it's a country of of 
counterfeit milk, for example, you know, for for years. It's, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of kind of like governance issues in China. So, so you know, it's uh, that that it leaves that off the table. But it also it also becomes a kind of a way of 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 not not kind of having that conversation about like why is our government so bad like why are our, our government officials so corrupt why do they let these things happen and that is a much harder conversation and that's something that 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 we see a lot in South Africa as well dealing with South African issues where there's no foreigners involved you know um, so you know the kind of bad management on electricity bad, man, bad management on water treatment on, on, on at every single level of, of society there's some kind of problem in, in the way that that that, they, that that the the place is governed, and it becomes so kind of pervasive that the Chinese example becomes the one salient example that you can draw on because it draws attention anyway because there are Chinese people involved. Whereas if you're simply talking about why is X town outside of Nairobi why why do they why do they have potholes for example, that is just as indicative of this wider problem, but it's much harder to get attention paid to it because everyone is so used to it. It's interesting you say that because all of the issues that we hear in the news, at least, and that's what I follow most closely, are outside of South Africa. South Africa has a very large labor force working for Chinese companies. First Automotive Works, Hisense, these are big factories that are in South Africa. But because South Africa has a very strong labor code and also very strong labor unions, it does seem again that it fits the pattern that we've seen elsewhere where Chinese actors tend to adapt to whatever level of governance is in that respective country. So South Africa is a much higher standard, and the Chinese seem to adapt to that standard. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, one of the issues we saw a lot last year was a lot of illegal Chinese gold mining that's going on, and then poor treatment of workers working for these illegal Chinese gold mines. Again, because the governance levels vary so radically between the two. One other just quick point, kind of unrelated to what we've been talking about today, but about Chinese labor. So far, 2021 and late 2020 have been absolutely horrific years for Chinese kidnapping in Africa, especially in West Africa and in the Gulf of Guinea. There have been uh, almost every week, if not maybe every two or three weeks, but certainly on a consistent basis, And this is something we track in our daily email newsletter. The kidnappings of Chinese nationals has gone up considerably in Nigeria. Bear in mind, too, that kidnappings writ large have gone up in Nigeria and in the Gulf of Guinea. So it's a bad year all around. But the Chinese seem to be more targeted than other nationalities, in part because there is a growing perception, I don't know if it's true or not, that they're paying ransoms. And if they're paying ransoms, then that's just going to fuel more kidnapping. But I think that's going to make it more difficult to attract Chinese managers to come to parts of Africa where kidnappings are becoming a a bigger, much more serious problem. So final thoughts to you, Kobus, on this big issue of Chinese labor management style, the presence of Chinese companies. We've spoken to a number of experts over the year, including Miriam and now Ding. What's your your big picture thought on this issue? One of the questions that, that, that I asked Ding was, was about the issue of, 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 of how African governments are adapting to, to the presence of foreign companies. Um, and I think this is going to become a bigger, bigger, a, a much a continuing kind of issue. Um, because obviously, you know, as, as we've also been, been kind of drum beating over the, over the years, China, Africa is one of the world's last real emerging markets. You know, so it's, it's the only real emerging market for something like mobile phones, for example. It's, it's the only place where you can really, where you really have a, a large contingent of, uh, of the population who's, who's, who's now buying their first phone, for example. So there's a lot of money to be made in Africa at, at, at many levels. And that means it's going to be many more companies that are going to be interested in, in, in doing business business there as they become more used to the concept. So it's going to be up to African governments to, to, to make that possible, to make it feasible. You know, for, for countries countries in other parts of the global south, like where you live, like in Vietnam, government, governments have been able to really like like hike the kind of the 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 kind of standard of living of, of the population by by having kind of foreign manufacturing and, and foreign, you know, a larger presence of foreign companies there. But that is on the back of, of of at least you know kind of being able to ensure a, a level of safety for for their workers 
if that's not if if governments even this deep in the game, if a country the size of Nigeria, you know, Africa's biggest economy, if they can't guarantee the the safety of foreigners working there, then why would anyone bother going there? You know, it's like you know, then then one has to kind of throw out all of these discussions about like oh development and all of these you know the the need for African development, the moral need or the economic need, the global need for African development has to be balanced with. Uh, is Africa enabling its own development? And if it isn't, then there's a whole bunch of stuff there that that needs to be unpacked, right? Kind of, there's no way of 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 you know, kind of of working with the country if 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 they they won't do the the very basics of at least kind of you know ensuring the safety of foreign workers. So you know, it's it's like it's there. there there's something I think you know that 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 in a way I think. Well, one has to demand a lot more from African governments, and I think that they're, that they're being demanded of at the moment. Okay, well, let's leave the conversation there. This is the kind of issue we talk about every single day, and it's one of those issues that you can't understand unless you're following it on a day-by-day basis, because if you're just picking up a paper here or a paper there or talking to someone, you're not going to get the whole picture. In our daily email newsletter, we're tracking every single one of these issues on labor issues, on terrorism, on kidnappings, on on all the latest research, like what Ding's writing is, is all about. So hope that you'll check out our daily email newsletter just to make sure you can try and get up to speed on all these complex issues in the China-Africa space. And more and more, we're following China and the Global South. Go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Uh, try it out for free for 30 days. If you don't like it, you can cancel any time. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either Kobus or myself, Eric at ChinaAfricaProject.com. That's E-R-I-C at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Or Kobus, C-O-B-U-S at ChinaAfricaProject.com. So that'll do it for this edition. Until next week, for Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com.